Okay. Wow. It's, uh, it's really testing us. Um, <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, li- uh, li- it's pro- I mean, as, as, uh, as they say, you know, the walls are there to, to, to check how bad you want it. Um, so this was like wall number three uh, tonight. I'm, Don't I'm already sweating. <laughs> Don't worry. Anyway, anyway, go on. So uh, you, you were saying um, sort of um, we were talking about uh, sort of your first entrepreneurial venture and then yeah. uh, and um, mm-hmm. high college and, uh, right. and mm-hmm. getting started in college. So, so yeah, you know, that was, um, that was back in 2007 and, uh, and that was the first uh, sort of technology focused entrepreneurial adventure that, that I embarked on. Um. How did you get into the, did you get into venture capital? Did you sort of dream, dream of sort of venture capital career when you were in college or what was the sort of secret, secret origin story there? I think, um, you know, I learned about venture capital when I was still in high school, again, from having just been in the Bay area and learning about what it was here. Um, but the light bulb went off for me when, uh, when I was working on a startup in college uh, called Artsy, it's a marketplace for uh, for discovering art and uh, Exibytes, right? The initial name. Yeah, the original name was Exibytes. We don't talk about that. Those were dark, dark days. Uh, and, and you were at Princeton during that time, or no, no, no. I, I joined later, but I met uh, Carter yeah. in 2011. Uh, he yeah. was at he was at General Assembly uh, back yeah. then. Yeah. Yeah, and we started in 2008. And so um, in summer of 2009, we came out to the Bay Area and we actually lived out of my parents' house. We we went and pitched uh, a bunch of VCs and everyone turned us down. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember going into all those offices and thinking, wow, these people have an amazing job. One day I want to get to invest in startups. Uh, and so I think that's when the light bulb went off for me. Um, mm. And then when I, uh, you know, a couple of years later, I had the chance to intern at a venture capital firm in New York, Insight. Uh, and I didn't realize that venture was something people did, you know, early in their careers. I thought it was something you did once you'd made it as an entrepreneur or as a CEO, and, and then you, you got to invest. But I had the chance to intern at, at Insight, and um, and that was in the summer of 2010. And and uh, shockingly, you know, 10 years later, here I am still, still investing uh, and, and sort of never went back to do anything else. Right. L- let's zoom in a little bit. What are some of the lessons you learned at uh, sort of your, uh, your period at Insight? So this was your first uh, sort of VC job. I-, I assume you joined as an associate. And sort of what did you learn there? Yeah, I joined as a summer analyst and then an analyst uh-huh. and very, very much the bottom of the ladder. Um, you know, I learned about many of the basics of the business. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, venture capital is sort of five different parts. Uh, it is uh, finding companies to invest in, part one, mm-hmm. uh, making decisions to invest, uh, investment decisions, part two, uh, winning the right to invest, um, because often you're competing with uh, with other venture firms for the right to, to work with that entrepreneur. That's part three. Uh, then helping those companies once you've invested, part four. And then getting an exit, part five. Uh, you know, either the company that you've invested in gets acquired or goes public. And so what I learned at Insight was just how to think about the business as, as sort of the sum of these five different parts. Mm-hmm. And uh, Insight and the analyst program there is very focused, particularly on the first bucket, you know, finding companies to invest in sourcing mm-hmm. uh, and a little bit on decision-making, you know, on, on judgment, the second, the second part as well. Um, and I feel very lucky, you know, Insight was just uh, an incredibly talented set of, of people uh, to work with. And so um, that was probably the, the, the best part about working at Insight is that, I worked with so many people who are still investing today, uh, who, who have gone on to start companies um, and the Insight Mafia sort of all over uh, Silicon Valley and, and New York as well. Right. Um, sort of, we are done with all the softballs. Uh, let's uh, sort of get into <laughs> the sort of uh, 
de decomposing venture capital in, in the detail. Uh, so, um, yeah. I, I, I sort of I love this quote, uh, quote of yours, which is I uh, sort of uh, I've learned a lot from my partners, uh, Chasta, Jason Pressman, and Ravi Mohan have really pushed me in my investment judgment. Rob Corney Beer has encouraged me to develop theses for new sectors. Duke and Doc Pepper has been a huge advocate for my single entrepreneurs. So sort of like, let's uh, break it down. Uh, um, what do you mean by investment judgment and how did you develop it? Yeah, so, you know, I think um, judgment, which again is that second piece that I, I tried to describe earlier in our business is, you know, the, the core of venture capital because the reality for most people who are in venture at, um, at, at pretty good firms uh, with pretty good networks is that you'll see enough companies in your career, you'll, you'll meet enough entrepreneurs to ultimately have enough great entrepreneurs to ultimately have a great portfolio. Um, and so the key becomes how do you select the right companies? And, um, and, and so, you know, that is what I have tried to focus on to get better and better at over the last 10 years. Um, and it's really difficult because, uh, you know, there's a lot of luck involved in our business. Um, uh, it's much more art than science, especially at the early stage of investing, uh, which is the stage that I have focused on for a while now. Uh, and so, uh, so what I've tried to do is, is narrow down, you know, what are the things that I look for in every investment? Um, and, uh, and some of this is based on the right decisions that I've made. And a lot of it's based on wrong decisions that I've made. Um, and both, you know, you know, type one uh, sort of failure decisions where, um, you know, we invested in a company that, that, that went, went, uh, that went wrong and that didn't end up uh, returning capital to us, but more based on the sort of type two decisions where we missed investing in a great company. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, I spend a lot of my time thinking about this because it is sort of the core of our business. And so I think about that time when, um, you know, I was in front of Robin Hood, for instance, and, uh, you know, was spending a bunch of time with the founders before they ended up, uh, raising a series A. And I look back at that and think about what could I have done to change judgment there and to have led to us deciding to invest in Robin Hood at the A. Uh, you know, instead we, we, we ultimately decided to pass. Um, so why, why did you pass? What was the decision, decision making? Yeah, uh, I think the big reason was just uh, uncertainty about the near term business model. And Robin Hood did indeed, uh, you know, burn through a lot of capital before it ended up uh, generating a significant amount of revenue. Um, mm. You know, the thing that we missed was that the capital markets were really open during that time. And Robin Hood was able to raise a ton of capital to fund uh, unprofitable growth. And at scale, uh, you know, it, it does do significant revenue. The other thing that I think we underestimated was, um, you know, because people on Robin Hood just trade much more frequently than on regular trading platforms, uh, it's almost like, even though the, the assets under management of Robin Hood are much lower than Charles Schwab or E-Trade, the mm -hmm. dollar amounts getting traded every day are higher because people just trade more often uh, because Robin Hood's free. Uh, because it's so, so easy, yeah. Because it's so easy. And so I think the, the math around that means that Robin Hood's effective AUM is, is, mm -hmm. is actually way higher than the sort of the real AUM that it has because of how much people are trading. Uh, and the amount of money it's able to make now on every trade, uh, you know, makes up for all the costs. Um, so those are some of the things that we missed. Um, but, you know, maybe it would be helpful for me to sort of come back to uh, what are the things that I actually do look for in every investment? Yep. Uh, and I've kind of narrowed down to three things now that I look for in every, uh, in every company that, that I invest in. The first is early signs of product market fit, um, which means that there's a product uh, that, that's already got some users, even if it's 10 users, 100 users, uh, you can see that there's something here that people uh, are resonating with and, and that they love. And so 
that's the first characteristic that I look for. I struggle to invest in something before there's a product. Um, there's some amazing investors who are able to do that, but, but I struggle with that. The second is, the second characteristic is potential for a decades long customer relationship. So I love businesses where I can envision someone using this, this product that again has early signs of product market fit for many, many years. Um, mm -hmm. And that naturally lends itself to subscription business models. Uh, again, it, it lends itself to certain types of businesses over others. Um, and then the third characteristic that I look for is uh, mission-driven founders uh, who are building what I perceive to be their life's work uh, with this company. And sort of, you know, those are the three things that uh, inform most of the investments that I end up making. And that means, and it's, it means that I will miss out on stuff uh, because, you know, I'll miss out on something that, that's pre-product. Um, I'll miss out on, on something that's more of a one-time purchase frequency, but still could be a great business. So for instance, uh, didn't do any of the mattress companies, didn't do anything, haven't done anything in weddings or wedding dresses or that category. And there are good businesses that can be built there. It's just not for me. And I guess what I've realized is I'm comfortable um, missing out on, 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 on companies that don't fit those three characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to be that way. Otherwise you can be just driven mad by the fear of missing out uh, if you have sort of no framework for making the investment decision. So we can sort of, this is your circle of competence. You, you, everything, yeah. sort of everything outside, you let it, sort of let, you let it go. And you, I assume you have an end behind those conditions. Um, you know, sort of got it. Um, yeah. Let's talk about um, developing theses phys for new sectors. So what, mm -hmm. are, what, what have been your theses uh, sort of throughout your 10 year at venture, ca in venture capital and when, what, are, what are they now? Yeah, so, you know, I've, I've been more of a um, bottoms up uh, mm. thesis creator than a top down thesis creator. So what I mean by that is uh, I've gotten excited about thesis areas by spending time with entrepreneurs who are working on, uh, on something and then realizing, wow, there's really something here uh, the entrepreneurs are right about this thesis. Let me go mm -hmm. explore it, uh, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Let, less sort mm -hmm. of me um, hanging out in my bunker, doing a think week and coming up with a thesis as a result right. of that. So um, when I started at Shasta, the sort of, the, the big thesis that I worked a lot on was uh, consumer social communication platforms. Um, and uh, And I actually started to look at a lot of, vertical social networks during that time. Um, we had invested already in Nextdoor, which is a social network for neighborhoods. Um, mm -hmm. One of the, the verticals I was interested in was education. And um, I spent time meeting with a bunch of companies that were working on communication products and education, like uh, Remind 101 um, mm -hmm. uh, and Class Dojo. And, uh, and by spending time with the entrepreneurs, developed a thesis there for sort of bottoms up adoption and education leading to a communication platform that could be used by teachers, parents, and students. And that led to our investment in Class Dojo back in 2013. And so that's an example of one of the early theses that I had. Um, in 2014, uh, and I would say, by the way, on consumer social communication, I've sort of ebbed and flowed on that thesis over the years. Uh, I'm actually more excited about it um, more excited about that category of company today than I was mm. a year ago, than I was, you know, four years ago. Um, mm. Another example of a thesis that, that I've had that's been more prevalent throughout, it, it's not ebbed and flowed as much, is, um, is in creator tools and, mm -hmm. uh, and sort of uh, software that empowers creators, uh, that empowers entrepreneurship. So... Mm -hmm. Canva, which uh, I actually f I forgot that this is the t-shirt that I'm wearing. So, you know, uh, I just pulled it out of my, my closet this morning. But, um, but Canva was the first company that, uh, that, that, that we invested in, that I invested in, in that area. And so to give you a sense for how this thesis came about, 
you know, I met with the founders, Melanie and Cliff of Canva, and they were about six months into having launched that product. So they were already at a couple hundred thousand monthly active users. Those users mm-hmm. were... No, no guy, no guy Kawasaki yet. Very early, yeah. Very early, but, you know, no paid marketing. It had just grown organically. I think it was month six and about 400,000 monthly active users. Those users were creating over a million designs a month already. Um, uh, there was a small portion of them, I think like 10, 20,000 of those creators who had created, uh, you know, over 20 designs each on Canva. Um, it was growing 30 to 40% every month. And then you could see in the early cohorts, in the retention of those early cohorts, that 40% plus of every cohort was still using Canva uh, every month. And so there was something Crazy. already there. But mm-hmm. before I'd met Canva, I hadn't been thinking about creator tools, design software. So this is what I again mean by, by more of the bottoms up thesis making. Um, mm-hmm. Spent time with them, thought it was super interesting. Then I went and looked at the whole space um, to see what was out there. And, uh, and we ended up coming back to Canva as the most interesting, really early stage company uh, and, and invested in, in the company's seed round in 2014. And that thesis of design driven software created tools uh, has led to several other investments over the years. So I started thinking about what could be like Canva for video. Um, and that led to investments in Frame.io in a company called Kapwing as well. Um, and, and, and that was the result of seeing the power of Canva, uh, you know, and how it had built a design platform that so many people use, but mm-hmm. thinking about a form of media, a form of expression video that was rising in popularity. Um, over the last several years. And, and so, um, so hopefully that gives you a sense for some of the, the theses that I've had. Yeah, it, do- it does. Uh, so um, we mentioned sort of the creator tools. I noticed mm-hmm. quite a few companies in food space. So in Perfect Foods, the Farmer's Dog, sort of tell us about yeah. your f- thesis there. Yeah, so um, coming back to what I said earlier, which is, these three things that I look for in every investment, early signs of product market fit, uh, potential for a decades long consumer relationship, customer relationship, uh, and third mission driven founders, um, you know, farmer's dog and imperfect fit all, all of those, um, those three categories, uh, you know, food in general is one of those things that we, we consume every day, uh, multiple times a day, uh, for our whole lives. And, and so, whether it's human food or dog food, um, food, uh, a, 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 you know, as a percentage of GDP as well as a percentage of our spend is, is a massive amount. Uh, and so it is a category that many venture investors have invested in with a number of companies. Uh, so I, I'm not alone in this, but, um, but both Farmer's Dog and Imperfect fit those, those three characteristics. Um, And I got excited about them roughly at the same time. We invested in Imperfect in 2016 and Farmer's Dog in 2017. Um, And, uh, and, you know, uh, I'd looked at a bunch in food before that. I spent time with Sprig. uh, I spent time with DoorDash and Postmates Mm -hmm. and probably messed up those investments and should have done them. Um, uh, But I'm glad that I you know, that we made a few investments in that general world um, thereafter. Um, so I, I saw that you're an investor in Block. Uh, and uh, so I can't just pass by the following question, which is sort of tell me about your thoughts on sort of coding bootcamps. What's the future there? Uh, yeah. Sort of, could you elaborate on that? Yeah, so, um, so Block, uh, BLOC, was a company that we'd invested in um, and it provided, uh, you know, these online coding boot camps, fully online uh, experiences uh, for people to learn how to code. Uh, Block ended up getting acquired by Thinkful, which which then got acquired by Chegg more recently. And so I haven't. Uh, I ended up actually being on the board of Block for a couple of years, but but uh, but haven't thought deeply about the space for the last several years. Um, you know, I think what's interesting is the the sort of online coding bootcamp became commoditized. There were several companies that were doing well with this, um, like Hack Reactor, um, 
mm-hmm. you know, GA, uh, General Assembly, uh, Bloc, others. But, um, but each one of them struggled to scale beyond uh, tens of millions of revenue uh, and to really scale to you know, tens of thousands of students at once, um, hundreds of millions in revenue, uh, you know, really, really big company. Um, and I think part of the issue is they all ended up looking the same. You know, yeah. every one of them touted great results. Everyone touted, you know, you know, great placements, great this great outcomes. Um, the most interesting company in that space, I think since, uh, all of these players is Lambda school, which, um, which has a completely different model for, for payment, the income share agreement, um, which, which means that you actually only pay uh, once you've gotten a job and you pay back Lambda School uh, you know, uh, once you're there. And so that has opened up the ability to take one of these programs to anyone, uh, regardless of how much money they have today, uh, because they just don't have to pay for it up front. Um, and I think Lambda School has also done a phenomenal job building a brand, uh, you know, on, on, on social media, places like Twitter with its CEO, Austin. Those are things that this first generation of coding boot camps failed to do. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, I sort of have trepidation about this space because I've seen mm. how challenging it is to scale. And fundamentally, learning the code, as you know, is, is, is not easy. And you have to put a lot of work into it. And there's... Um, it, it's, it's not for everyone, right? Not everyone can just turn themselves into a software engineer. And so I struggle with the category because I think not everyone can benefit from it. But I do think mm-hmm. a business like Lambda School can have enough powerful uh, sort of flywheels um, uh, that it may just, you know, be able to break the sort of scale barrier necessary to tip um, and be kind of a, 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 a really big business in that space. Mm-hmm. Um, what is so? You mentioned you mentioned uh, his DoorDash. You mentioned Robinhood. Sort of what are some other companies you you passed on and sort of I guess the, the anti anti portfolio sort of uh, oh, section of our program. So many. I mean, um, you know, uh, Stitch Fix is a company that we met. Uh, I still go and look back at that deck to see uh how we got that wrong um you know katrina was the founder was uh was very compelling um but it was a time and the company had early signs of product market fit so it actually fit a bunch of the things that i'm talking about Mm -hmm. uh the thing that we overanalyzed was the competitive landscape there were a lot of people trying to do some form of discovery you know uh um to enable a fashion uh, buying experience from home. Um, and it turned out, I think Stitch Fix uh, had done the best job sort of uh, productizing it and figuring out how to leverage data to make the, the experience better and better. Um, but that was one that we met very early on at the Series A stage and, and we missed. Um, mm-hmm. there, are, there are tons of others, uh, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. It's just the nature of, of mm-hmm. our business. Um, yeah, I think that one of the most painful ones is, is probably Zoom um, because, of course, you know, how, how big it is today. And, uh, and again, it was, it was overanalyzing the market. There were so many different video conferencing products back then. Uh, when did you beat them? Uh, I think it was 2015 when we met Zoom. Mm. So it was already, the business was already working. It was already millions in revenue. Um, Mm. and trying it out, you could tell that it was a great product, uh, Mm. and, 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 and just something better than, than what a bunch of us had tried before in video conferencing. But again, there were so many people doing something in video conferencing. There were so many incumbents that had built something that, you know, Google's in video conferencing. How do you compete with Google if they are giving away hangouts for free? You know, these are some of the things that we, um, that we lost sleep over and, and, and led to, you know, um, the lack of a yes decision on Zoom. Um, this business is hard. And, and unfortunately, yeah. everyone in venture capital has more companies that they missed than 
that, that ended up being great than they did that ended up being great. That's just the nature of our, our work. Um, and it sucks. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to fathom. For sure. Um, what is uh, common among the sort of the hell no companies, you know, the companies you, uh, you sort of, you, you, you saw their pitch. You, so you, you, you saw, you saw their deck, you had them come in, but you just, immediately knew that it's not, not going to work and you were right. So uh, sort of what is common among those sort of uh, uh, those companies? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, uh, there's sometimes just uh, a lack of transparency, a lack of directness that comes through in the pitch and in answering questions that can be a real turnoff and, and can lead to hell no. Um, mm -hmm. I really gravitate towards businesses that are simple to understand. And, and so, you know, I, I, I've just always felt like the most powerful companies are, are actually the simplest to explain. Um, mm -hmm. And so I've been a uh, hell no on, on some companies that are just complicated and where it takes five minutes to even explain what the company does. Uh, mm. I lose interest in those five minutes and I struggle to see myself getting there unless in the first five minutes I can quickly understand what it's doing and the entrepreneur is compelling to me um, you know that, that there's a number of those things that once you've done this job for long enough you, you sort of pick up on um, so I subconsciously probably have a list of a ton of things that are hell knows that, that, that mm -hmm. lead to, to, to knows pretty quickly um, you know, and they've just, they're just things that I picked up over, over, over time. What are some of the mistakes fine founders do while pitching? Uh, sorry, what founders do, Armand? So, so what kind of mistakes, uh, you know, the, the, uh, let's talk about sort of good founders, founders who are actually yeah. good, but at the actual pitch, at, during the actual performance, they don't yeah. do so well. What are, what are some of the most common mistakes yeah. there? Yeah, I think, um, look, what I said before, the lack of transparency, uh, mm. lack of conciseness. Like I've seen founders who have ended up doing great, who've had those things uh, mm. in, in their early pitches. Um, and so I think one of the things that the great founders do do is they learn and they adapt and they improve themselves over time. Um, and so everyone can just have a bad day, uh, you know, and everyone can, um, can make mistakes. The, the key I think is learning from them, being self-aware about them and then improving on them uh, over time. And so, uh, you know, I've met with companies where I felt, wow, that was a terrible pitch. And then they get funded, uh, a few weeks later by a great venture capital firm. And then a month later, I'm talking to my friend at that firm and they said, oh, they were incredible uh, mm. in the pit. And so, you know, we're all humans. Uh, this is a human business. And so there's tons of human error that, that can happen. And the other thing is that different people can perceive things differently. And so um, mm -hmm. hopefully that helps. Um, how many deals do you see a year? Oh, I think I, I've tried to analyze this in the past. So one measure for this is I take a, a new note on every, uh, every new company that I meet with or that I get um, sort of interested in enough to, to, to make a note, which is most companies um, that, that I end up meeting with. Uh, and I think I've taken roughly, uh, you know, 3,000 notes at Shasta um, on new companies over eight years. So that's something like um, 350 notes a year, something. Like so, so it's probably, it's probably somewhere in the range of, you know, 400 to 500 uh, new companies that I, that I meet with a year, sort of more than one a day. Um, uh, and, and so that's the rough top of funnel for me. Um, What's the, um, and how, how, how does it actually work? Let's say uh, uh, your, your partner um, who is focusing on, let's say, hardware companies, 
uh, gets uh, gets pitched on I don't know mall bio startup, which is let's say your 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 theme, does he pass it to you? Uh, so how do you guys pass sort of the deals around? Yeah, I think different firms work in different ways. So Shasta, um, uh, you know, I think each of us tries to figure out is this company interesting, and if it's interesting, but it's not for me, uh, mm-hmm. then then you know to pass it on to someone else on the team who it may just be a better fit for. Um, right. So that does happen. Uh, but I would say in general, um, you know, my mentality has always been to try to prioritize, to not take up too much of my partner's time, uh, to only pass things on to others on the team if I truly think they are, uh, they are worth a meeting. Um, because the biggest constraint in our in our day to day jobs is time and mm-hmm. uh and we have to be ruthless with our time um to be effective so open the curtain behind the sort of investment committee um how many sort of how many yeses does it take to to um to to fund the company yeah so at shasta we have um a voting system so a company comes in and presents to our group and then the company leaves and we're debriefing the company and each uh each member of the team rates a company votes on a company from uh one through four four being uh strongly supportive one being strongly not supportive uh and and therefore two being you know slightly not supportive three being slightly supportive um what we need in our decision is for at least two members of the team to be force. So Mm -hmm. at least two people need to be strongly supportive, you know, really want to make this investment. And then the majority of the group needs to be supportive. So that's, that's the general criteria that we have. Um, And so that enables us to have decisions that are controversial. Uh, So, multiple people on the team may be not supportive of, of an investment, but we may still move forward with that investment because there are two people, at least two people who are sort of uh, pounding the table to make the investment. And the majority of the group is, is comfortable with making the investment. Um, and we're constantly, you know, I think the most important thing is to constantly iterate on that, uh, on that system and to uh, improve it as you gather more data. Uh, mm-hmm. And so I'm sure that system is going to change over time. Um, venture capital is very different from sort of public company investment investing. Uh, but is it possible? And do you, do you guys uh, sort of, what is your sort of opinion on this? Uh, uh, what can you um, adopt from, from Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett's view of the world? Like what kind of sort of, yeah. uh, is is it possible to take any of those sort of any of the items from their investment checklist and apply it in venture capital? I think there absolutely uh, there absolutely are, and I I would say I've learned a ton from um, from studying them, uh, reading about sort of frameworks uh, like uh, Seven Powers by Hamilton Helmer, um, mm-hmm. which uh, apply to business strategy and. And he has, um, you know, public, uh, uh, you know, investing vehicle, um, uh, and so applies those things to public companies. But I think you can apply those to, to private companies as well. Um, and then I've learned a lot just from seeing public companies and how they've operated. You know, I've, I've been, uh, you know, I've been experimenting in public investing for a long time and have taken a sort of venture like approach to my own public investing. So Mm -hmm. if you looked at my 401k right now, you know, I think, um, uh, my portfolio is, is something like 10% in Shopify, 10% in zoom, um, Mm -hmm. 15% in Amazon, uh, 15% in Netflix. Um, it's very tech heavy, uh, and the reason is I just believe in those companies as long-term companies. And by the way, this isn't investment advice, but I'm just, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, just revealing it for the purposes of, of education. Um, uh, and so I've taken those sort of long positions. Like I, I would 
uh, like I do as a venture investor in my public investing, and I've learned from um, from from those businesses and how they've. Uh, you, you look at Shopify, for instance, which which started as a public company at about a two billion dollar market cap, and is today at about a ninety billion dollar market cap. That forty five x is like, you know, a dream venture investment, and um, and I think my my average cost basis in Shopify is about. 80 bucks and it's over 800 bucks in the public markets. And so Amazing. I've operated it like a venture investment um, and learn from that. So I think anyone uh, who thinks about public markets can learn a lot to apply to, to private markets. Yeah, I can see that. Create a tool, right? Create That's, a tool slash e-commerce. Tool. Yeah. Create a tool. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a theme here for sure. Uh, the other way I like to describe this thesis is arming the rebels. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, enabling entrepreneurship everywhere. Uh, and uh, I am a big fan of that. Uh, for, for an ambitious college student who wants to join Shasta as an analyst or an associate, how does one get qualified at the age of 22, 23? Yeah, so I think, um, I think there are a lot of things that, that you can do early in your career to stand out. Um, you know, if you've shown... Uh, sort of entrepreneurial instincts. Uh, mm -hmm. Venture capital is an entrepreneurial job and you have to be a self-starter to figure out how to find the best companies to invest in and to make investment decisions, um, to gel with entrepreneurs. It helps to have been one before or to have mm -hmm. thought like one. Um, and so I think, you know, that's a characteristic that I look for, that a lot of folks look for uh, as they add to their venture teams. Um, you know, I think it's more important than ever to be, uh, to try to be a specialist in something, to try to be an expert in something. And mm -hmm. I think what's amazing about the internet is it's enabled anyone from anywhere to become an expert because, you know, you can listen to every podcast episode with a VC mm -hmm. and become an expert about VC as a result of that. You know, you look at someone like Harry Stebbings who started the 20 Minute VC um, where he interviews VCs. And I think he's done several thousands of these now. And by just doing that, by being entrepreneurial enough to start that and do it, he has become an expert. And by the way, he's now become a venture investor. And so mm -hmm. you know, I think um, the, the general principle of uh, finding something that you love and that you love doing every day and that you love waking up to do every day uh, and hopefully having that thing be something of interest, uh, you know, something that leads to expertise, something that leads to a unique specialization. Um, that's something that anyone can do. And, uh, and I think, you know, you, if you do that, you know, you can stand out to get a job in venture, but you could stand out to get, you know, a career opportunity in a lot of different areas. That that's sort of leads uh, leads us to a sort of a comfortable segue to podcasting. Uh, what are what are your sort of three top three favorite podcasts? Sort of the ones you you sort of find yourself listen, yeah, uh, sort of listening frequently. Yeah. yeah so one that I listen to um, religiously is Stratechery by Ben Thompson. Uh, now I'm a subscriber to Ben Thompson's. Um, essays, his, his newsletter. And with that comes the podcast in a bundle today. Um, but I think he's probably the smartest uh, sort of um, accessible tech thinker. Uh, and he writes and, and, and now he's, he, he, he does his, his podcast as well uh, four days a week. Um, and so I've learned a lot from his thinking and, and that's, that's someone who I, whose podcast I really enjoy uh, and then someone else who I've, I've gravitated towards recently is uh, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, um, Invest Like the Best is his podcast. And I think he's mm -hmm. had a number of great conversations with folks. So he recently had Toby Lutka from Shopify um, mm -hmm. in a great chat. The cool thing about Toby is he says something different in every podcast. So I listened to him on, <laughs> on um, Invest Like the Best and it was a different conversation to listening to him on how I built this or on, um, on, on another show. Uh, so I encourage people to check that one out. And, and, and Patrick has had a, a number of great guests to, to learn, to learn from. And then 
I'll give a shout out to Harry Stebbings as well. I think uh, mm -hmm. his format has been fun. I've learned a ton from him uh, and from his guests. And uh, and uh, again, he's he's got a very easily uh, digestible format. So you kind of know what to expect now when you listen to him. And that consistency makes it a good listening experience. Yeah, and it, it's sort of gradually turning into a 40-minute podcast, uh, sort of 40 minutes VC. <laughs> <laughs> um, sort of, uh, when, we, when we look at the podcasting, sort of podcasting landscape, sort of on one hand, we have sort of Joe Rogan's and uh, yeah. sort of uh, um, uh, Howard, Howard Stern's of a world where it's, it's a long form, extremely long form, three hours, a lot of banter, uh, yeah. um, sort of more of an entertainment. And then on the other hand, we, we have Tim Ferriss, let's say, uh, the Knowledge pro pro Project with Shane Parrish, which is like sort of high density, high signal, low voice, uh, sort of uh, low noise. But when I talk to friends and we sort of discuss podcasts, we, so I love learning from podcasts, sort of I love the Knowledge Project. But when you want just to relax, uh, uh, you go for Joe Rogan. Sort of how do you, f is, is it possible to find sort of a, a, a balance, let's say as a, as a, as a, as a podcaster, uh, is it possible to find this balance between banter and sort of high learning, sort of high, den high density of content? Mm -hmm. So what are, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not an expert on, on podcasts. I think my sense is that you can find a balance. You know, I think even um, the ones that I mentioned, right, uh, Stratechery and, and uh, Invest Like the Best are more wonky. Um, uh, are more, you know, intense experiences where you have to focus throughout. I think even Harry Stebbings is is more banter and and more entertainment um, than mm. than those other two, um, and and there are many that are on the the, the banter side, um, but I do think it's important to have an authentic voice and to have consistency. And so I think you can fall on all sorts of. Uh, portions of the spectrum you just described, but mm -hmm. um, the ones who do a good job uh, are the ones who are just authentic to themselves and that are consistent over and over again. So you sort of know when you open that up what to expect and you, you know that it's good for your commute or it's good for your workout or, you know, whatever environment you're in and, and listening to that podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your advice to someone who is... Um, not looking to start a venture back business who mm -hmm. wants to start a small business um, who wants to bootstrap it, but has no idea what problem to solve. Sort of mm. agnostic, agnostic entrepreneur, agnostic sort of amateur businessman yeah. who has no idea what problem to solve, who doesn't care what problem to solve, but so sort of what, what's your advice to him or her? My advice is I think, you know, being an entrepreneur just for the sake of being an entrepreneur is not usually a recipe for success. Even if, even if you, you just want small success, uh, bootstrap success, I do think entrepreneurship is, is so challenging. Uh, it's so challenging to get anything off the ground and have it resonate with people that you have to be passionate about that thing and you have, you have to be passionate about some aspect of it to, to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I guess uh, I struggle with the question because um, I think if you're not passionate at all about anything, then, then, you know, that, then you shouldn't try to go be an entrepreneur and create it. Um, uh, and uh, in my experience, you know, I, first of all, I think, the premise to your question is a great one, which is there are lots of businesses that don't need venture capital funding. Um, there are lots of amazing entrepreneurs who uh, are building sort of scale businesses, not scale businesses. Um, and, uh, and that's great. You know, I, I look at like, um, I have a number of friends right now who are writing newsletters and, uh, and they're trying to build their own business from, uh, from writing. And I think that's awesome. I mean, they're not venture scale businesses, but it's people who love writing, who love putting their thoughts into the world, uh, who, um, 
who are going off and being entrepreneurs through their newsletters and uh and uh and 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 i think i think you know it, it i'm i'm all for businesses like that uh i'm all for any type of entrepreneurial in, endeavor but you have to have a reason to get into it um and i think you have to question yourself uh as to whether or not that reason's authentic um because i don't think it it can be successful i don't think it's going to be fun uh you know unless it is what's your advice to someone uh looking to start a micro vc firm so um and what's your what's your view on the the landscape in general there are a ton of hundreds of micro vc firms in the past decade sort of what's your view there yeah so look there are a lot of firms and uh i have a ton of respect for many of these micro vcs i think you have to figure out as a small fund you know unless you're a big platform fund like sequoia for instance where you do every stage uh, every geography every sector uh unless you're like that then you have to figure out where you're going to be a specialist um and what you are going to invest in but almost more importantly what you won't invest in um to define your focus uh so I, so my advice to micro vcs is to to figure that out uh to narrow the focus more and more and to become known for something um because it's impossible to boil the ocean as a as a micro vc uh you know but i think uh a lot of these are really interesting uh there are a lot of really interesting firms getting created a lot of them are just solo um investors as well and we've we've sort of seen the rise of the solo capitalist in the last couple of years in our industry and i think it's an interesting trend where um people who uh who are sort of like angel investors are also raising funds um uh and institutional funds behind them uh so uh, i'm excited about about a lot of micro vcs and sort of this next generation of micro vcs but the ones that i'm ex- excited about are the specialists um Mm-hmm. that makes sense absolutely um so we have two sections left so we'll uh, okay. we have a sort of rapid fire section then followed by uh sort of uh, some of the pitches and questions from the audience so uh for listeners uh please leave your questions and uh you have we'll we have around 10 minutes before we'll start the the sort of Q&A part uh so let's turn into rapid fire um what's the what's different between you between you now and you 5 years ago um i think uh you know i'm 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 a more confident happier person um and a big part of that is uh you know in my personal life i'm i'm married now uh and congratulations uh yeah thank you and and uh I I really appreciate that. Uh I think I think I've matured in a whole bunch of ways. So, um yeah, there's probably a lot of things that are that are different. So the one belief which uh which 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 changed? One belief that's changed in the last 5 years. Um you know, I think uh I think 5 years ago I I probably thought more about um work as like the main priority and today I think of uh you know family and health as more important priorities than than work um so that's that's the first thing that came to my mind yeah, that's wonderful uh what's a small habit what small habit which has which has made the biggest difference in your life I would say recently um I've been writing uh almost every day. I have a habit tracker and so to keep myself honest there's been a few days in the last couple of months that I've I've missed it but um but almost every day I've been been writing and uh I've been writing for uh for myself but I've been publishing um some essays on a new newsletter um uh as well and I'm loving it. I mean it's it's a small thing in in some ways but it's a big it's a big commitment in others. Um but just like the the increased clarity of thought that I have I think from writing something every day uh has really helped me and um 
And so, uh, so that's the one that, that again first came to mind. What books do you wish you read earlier? Oof. Uh, gosh, there's a lot here. So, um, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, one, one book that, uh, that comes to mind right now is, um, is Anti-Fragile by uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, which uh, is certainly very relevant right now, uh, you know, in, in the sort of chaos and disorder that, that, that's happened in the world in the last couple of months. Uh, the, the concept of this is, um, you know, fragility, uh, you know, the, the, the opposite of fragility is, is anti-fragile. And it's actually, it's more than resilience or robustness because it actually enables you to be better uh, and to thrive in a world that that's more chaotic and more disorderly, and so um, so that's one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Whose mind mind would you like to read if you had a superpower of mind reading? I think um, you know Bill Gates is uh, is just such a incredibly profound thinker and. I feel like there's more in that mind than in in most human minds. Um, that I, that in the Netflix documentary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so I feel like I've I've gotten inside it a little bit through the documentary, and you know, I'd say like Elon Musk, you, you get a sense for what his mind is like because of how public he is. But I feel like with Bill Gates, there's still so much behind that, and there's so many things that he's thinking about, and and look at how he's reacted to COVID nineteen, and it, it it's it's incredible how much thought he had sort of already put into this pandemic before it even happened. And so, uh, you know, that's someone whose mind I'd, I'd love to read. Love it. Uh, what do you say to a friend when he or she's down? I think the best thing you can do when, when someone's down is just to listen to them and, uh, to, to sort of crawl into the cave with them to try to empathize. Uh, you know, I, I've tried to learn that, um, you know, just saying it's going to be okay uh, isn't uh, the way to empathize with someone. Uh, the way to empathize is to say, wow, that really sucks. And to sort of get on their level and to listen to them and to empathize. And I think if you do that, that's actually the best way to, uh, to pick someone up. Um, is to sort of show that they have someone who's with them in that cave, uh, uh, in that low place. Mm -hmm. uh, any skill you are sort of trying to acquire in the next year or so? Um, Apart from writing, I guess. Yeah, I think in general, like you know, I'm I'm constantly thinking, wow, I wish I could reinvent myself. I wish I could do things differently. I wish I could be healthier. Um, uh, you know, I wish I could be more productive. I wish I could manage my time better. Uh, you know, time management, as I said before, is is maybe the hardest part of this job. And so uh, I guess my wish for myself a year from now is that I figured out a better way to manage my time. Um, and that's probably going to be my, my wish for myself, you know, 10 years from now as well. Mm -hmm. What advice seems obviously right is relatively easy to follow but is usually ignored. I think it is, um, you know, it's, it's probably about developing good habits, right? Like I think, I think we all know that um, there are certain things that should be habitual that we should do every day. Um, but we just don't do them. And, uh, and so um, I think making a habit out of anything is something everyone should do, but unfortunately few people do. What's your favorite question when you're trying to learn something from a founder or from a friend? Sort of the qu one question you sort of you, uh, you find yourself coming back to. You know, I always love to hear the sort of origin story of someone uh, and, and, and the narrative uh, over a longer period of time. So I'll sometimes put off entrepreneurs um, when I ask about, you know, 
their, their, their childhood? Where did they grow up? Um, because uh, it isn't something that comes up in every pitch, I think. But, um, but it's something I always want to understand because I feel like I can learn more about the person from having uh, understood where they came from. And, uh, and so, you know, just like the first question, I think you asked me on this, on this Instagram live, you know, I, I always try to ask that question, um, you know, both in a professional context, but also in a personal context. Uh, your top three favorite foods. Okay. So, uh, number one, I'll put, uh, uh, dal, like I, I can eat, uh, I can doll is probably like you know the the thing I can eat the most of uh in the world especially you know doll made by by my mom or dad at, at home um uh so that's number one on the list uh you know number two I'll put the sort of guilty pleasure I think uh uh can always eat fries um and number three I'll put another guilty pleasure which is uh ice cream mm -hmm. uh your Three favorite restaurants. So, um, I will put uh, one as uh, Indian Accent in in New Delhi, um, mm. which is an incredible restaurant that I uh, uh, actually went to last in December with my uh, with my wife and with our families. We did a joint family dinner. Uh, sorry, joint family lunch to celebrate our wedding anniversary. And that was a really special meal, but just an incredible, incredible meal. Um, so that's one. Uh, let's see. Hey, Hello. you still there? Hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. So go right on. Back. Okay. So number two, um, a restaurant called Babel in, um, in, in South Africa, in the uh, Stellenbosch area of South Africa. Just the most amazing uh, fresh produce that I've had. Uh, uh, the, the, the menu is organized by red, green, and yellow by different colors. And every dish is, is that color. Uh, look it up on Instagram, whatever. It's, it's, it's amazing. And then number three, I suppose I should go with somewhere in San Francisco um that i love uh gosh this is hot um i will do kind of a classic san francisco place burma superstar tea leaf salad um i kind of feel like that for lunch now having for <laughs> up. that's pretty cool um so so we have uh one have been remaining do you mind if we if we end this and then yeah. restart okay sounds good Hey, hello. So apologies to listeners. Uh, would you mind sort of uh, uh, retyping your questions again? Because we lost them uh, when mo moving from, uh, from video to video. So uh, going back to so you, uh, so top three restaurants are there. Um, uh, let's see your most memorable classes in college. Most memorable classes in college. Um... One was uh, my freshman seminar. Um, uh, I took a class, a uh, freshman seminar on taxes with a professor named Harvey Rosen, who um, was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors to the, the president uh, before coming back to Princeton as a professor. And the reason it was so memorable is we just had an amazing group of people in that class. There were 12 of us, we were all freshmen. I'm still friends with many of the people in that class. And uh, I got to learn about a very practical topic, taxes, which still informs, you know, um, you know, the taxes that I do every year. And, and uh, I feel like I learned a lot from that class uh, for life. 
what questions or problems pop into your mind in the shower or keep you up at night these days? You know, I am um, thinking a lot about uh, climate change and um, and what we can do to solve the climate crisis. Uh, and I think once we're over this pandemic, that will be the the sort of the crisis that um, that that we come back to and realize, you know, how significant it is. Um, and so, uh, you know, just how to impress upon people um, how serious this is, is something that keeps me up. Mm -hmm. um, what are your main sources of energy? Yeah, I get a lot of energy out of um, conversations with super talented people. I mean, that is what I fundamentally love about this job. And, um, and it brings me energy every day. Uh, I also get a lot of energy out of just being outside and in nature, um, uh, you know, either on a walk or a hike or a run. Um, uh, so th those are the two things that, that come to mind. And the last are rapid fire. Are that? we getting the, um, the, the questions now? Yeah, yeah. We, we have okay. last, last rapid fire. What's your favorite right. quote? And then we're going to the questions for the audience. Wait, sorry, what was it? What's your favorite quote? Uh, wait, vote? Uh, what's your favorite quote or oh, sort sorry, of quotation? Sorry. Yeah. You Oh, that, oh gosh, favorite quote. Um, oh, that is so. I think um, uh, I think Churchill said this. Um, actually, sorry. So this this two. Can I cheat? Can I can I do two? Absolutely. Two that come. So one is uh, Churchill said, uh, "History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it." Um, which, uh, which, which is, uh, which is interestingly profound. Uh, the second one that came to mind is I think this was um, uh, by the, the guitarist in the Grateful Dead, but um, the quote was, uh, "Don't, don't be, don't try to be the best, be the only." Um, and that has also resonated with me when it comes to sort of career advice. Um, so th those are the two. Wonderful. So. Uh, question from the audience really quick and then we are uh, wrapping up um, okay. question from Bakhajan Kali uh, you got a genie in a bottle your free wishes <laughs> uh, gosh one wish is um, uh, climate crisis is ended um, uh, you know, that the we figured out how to sustainably live uh, on this planet, I think is probably the, the most important one. Oh, this is cool. Uh, uh, second is, um, you know, that we, uh, that we cure cancer, you know, I think it has killed so many people uh, who I, uh, who I know, who I'm associated with. Um, that's also top of mind. And then uh, third is that, um, you know, I, I get to, uh, I get to live a life where I'm, I'm happy every day. And, uh, and uh, I get to, you know, uh, give back in, in, in a meaningful way. Uh, so that, you know, when I'm, uh, when I'm at the end of my life, I can be proud of, 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 of what I did. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, next question coming from Swapanji. What companies you are looking forward to invest in two, three years? Um, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, some of the, well, it's hard to predict um, which these specific companies are going to be in, in two to three years. Um, but uh, I think the, the companies around arming the rebels, uh, you know, enabling entrepreneurship uh, are really interesting, particularly right now uh, in this era where many people are being forced to be entrepreneurs because they've lost their jobs. Uh, and so that's an area that I'm, that I'm really excited about. Uh, and then two sort of categories, sectors that I'm excited about are education and healthcare, which I think 
need to be disrupted fundamentally by technology. Uh, and there has to be innovation there. And so uh, those are some of the areas that I'm excited to invest in in the next two to three years. Thank you. Two more questions. And what financial ratios indicators do you use in decision making and on, in what time horizon? Yeah, uh, great question. So there's a lot of metrics that, um, that I look for to gauge early signs of product market fit, which I described earlier as kind of one of the three uh, core things I look for in every investment. So some of these metrics are uh, growth rate and what percentage of that growth is organic. Uh, the higher the percentage, the, the more exciting it is. That means that that, that product is benefiting from word of mouth. Uh, I look at things like um, lifetime value and cost of acquiring a customer to make sure that the unit economics makes sense. I look at payback period uh, to measure the efficiency of, of marketing spend and how quickly you get paid back on every customer you acquire. Uh, you know, I, I, I look at things like net promoter score to gauge how happy the customers are. Um, so all of the indicators are around how much product market fit is there. Uh, in this service and to try to gauge that at the early stage. Mm -hmm. Last one from the audience from Amangjan 2030. What skills do you plan to teach to your children? Well, I don't have uh, any kids today. Uh, so we're hypothetically talking about a future in which I, in which I do. But I think what I've learned is um, one of the most important skills is uh, curiosity and asking good questions. And that's fundamentally what I do uh, every day. And so, you know, I think what I'd want my kids to have is that innate curiosity, um, the desire to learn, the desire to ask questions. And so uh, I'm sure I'll be asking them a lot of questions and they'll be asking me a lot of questions, but um, uh, I'm sure that'll be a sort of foundation of our relationship. Thanks so much, Nikhil. Uh, sort of coming to a close, um, what's, uh, I don't know how to, how to hide this, but, uh, so what's your, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Last, coming to a close, wrapping up yeah. here, what's your advice to uh, fresh graduates entering the real world? Yeah, well, I think um, this is obviously a tough time to be uh, a graduate because, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tricky world out there and, and there's been a lot of chaos over the last couple couple months, but I think my advice is, you know, use this as an opportunity to do anything because all bets are off. Like, I think everyone gets a pass on 2020. 2020 has been such a crazy year that, um, you know, you're going to be forgiven for whatever risks you take in this time. Uh, and there's never a better time to take a risk than early in your career. So, my advice to, to you as a graduate is, um, you know, think of this as, as the chance to do anything and to get a whole pass, to get a free pass on, on, on what you do after you graduate. And, and so do something that you love, do something entrepreneurial. Uh, if, if there's something that you want to do there, uh, take those risks because there truly will never be a better time. You, you may not even have another option. And that makes it even better and even more acceptable. Um, so, uh, yeah, this has been great, man. Thanks so much for having me. And, and uh, thanks and so much for what? No, go ahead. Where, oh, where can uh, where can where can where can people find sort of find, where can people find you your sort of your blog posts? Uh, where where on the internet sort of uh, do you usually share your thoughts? Yeah, I think I would say I'm most active on Twitter. So uh, I'm just at NBT on, on Twitter, my initials. And uh, my blog is at uh, nbt.substack.com. Um, and so follow me on Twitter, subscribe if you want on the on the, the newsletter. 
and uh, would love love more questions and follow ups on Twitter, and, and we can keep the conversation going there. Thanks so much, Nikhil. Uh, it's uh, Nikhil Basutravedi. Next big big thing. Uh, really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks so much. Apologies for for this few hiccups we had uh, along the way. Uh, I hope to see you soon, uh, uh, sort of in person. And uh, have Thanks, a wonderful man. day. And uh, uh, continue success. Thank you, Arman, and thanks for having me. Uh, hope you have a good night, and uh, hope we get to see each other somewhere soon. Uh, great, to, great to see your face here. Thanks so much. See you, Nico. Bye bye. Bye. Uh, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, apologies for. Uh, sort of a few hiccups. We were initially planning to do this on Facebook Live, but ended up picking Instagram Live. Uh, this was an show. Live in the future and build what is missing. Bye-bye.